Can you can you, uh, can you put it in the music? We would have to rewrite the title of tonight into eyes to see and ears to hear. That's what I was thinking. I was, was sitting there. This is uh, where I need to begin. Need to begin with Isaiah. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, Amen. We continue with the trip through, the journey through the liturgy. Remember last time, those of us who were here, we, we spoke about the offertory, and we said there is two major themes in the offertory. Remember them? There was two big themes, that the liturgy of St. Basil and St. Gregory and St. Cyril work out of those two themes, and mainly all the liturgies, actually. There's two big themes, and then coming from um, a, a celebration. We make a celebration of what in the offertory? What is the, the celebration? What are we doing in the offertory? What are we remembering? We say there's three things we do in the liturgy all the time. We offer, we receive, and we remember. What are we remembering? And we start with that. Remember what last time what we were remembering in the offertory? The Lamb is one of the two themes, the Lamb of God, and the other theme is the Holy Trinity. But what is the occasion that actually combined them together? In which occasion the, the Trinity was revealed and the Lamb of God was revealed? The baptism of our Lord. So in the offertory, we remember the baptism. That's why the main theme is the baptism of the Lamb. And then in this baptism, we remember the Trinity, and we remember that. And that's why we sing the Sabbatri, and that's why we say, uh, we, we, we say that the bread is called the Lamb. Yes. I don't know. I don't know. When we finish, I will find it. So the next, the next part is the liturgy of the world. So what do we offer? Remember what we said, St. Gregory of Nazianza said. The, he said, I will ask you to offer something. Maybe you think it is gold or precious stone or what, what, what. But that, actually what we're offering, it's ourselves. The most precious gift that we can give to God. When we offer ourselves, there's two things that we, God would find in us. He would find number one and number two. The, the three things we offer, we remember every, every part of the liturgy, we offer, we receive, you give, you receive, and you remember. But that is how you have to offer yourself with a little cherry on the cake. You don't offer a cake that dry. You have to offer the cake I'm with some sure, topping. I'm with some. sure that if I was a farmer, yes. 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 It will be personal. Yeah. That's what the temple eventually lead, ended up in doing. They get people would get money and. Yes. That is exactly true. My thoughts were, when I looked at the basket, when I always look at the basket, why do you have too many loaves? Why don't the church just offer one loaf? Most probably that every house baked bread in that week, they would bring the best. They bring the best. Yes. So you have like 80 families, you have 80 loaves of bread in front of the priest. Yes. Some kind of, uh, something crept into, yeah. Yeah, the wine might not be, but the bread, because the bread is part, yeah, okay. And then places where they make wine. But the bread is the main is, is essence of it because it represents their life, their livelihood of the week. The house, but who bakes bread now? Not even in Upper Egypt they do it. Upper Egypt they get bread from the, bakery. So they, they bring the best loaf and the priest has to pick the best of the best. No, no, they used to bake bread, but no more. Yeah. Yes, there has to be, there has to be a, a process yeah. whereby they simplify the, the, the offer. To anyway, so we said the three things. We offer, we receive, and we offer ourselves, represented in the bread and the wine. And we have, to offer, we have to offer ourselves with two conditions that God would accept us as an offering. 
with what are the two conditions? Repentance is one, number two, and the main one. Hmm? No, thanksgiving. Because the name of the liturgy is? <laughs> yes, Eucharistia. Yes, so it is the two conditions that you offer, we offer ourselves with. So we realize in the offertory we offer ourselves mainly. And we offer ourselves in repentance and in thanksgiving. That's are the two major things that we offer ourselves in. And then how, what we receive? We receive forgiveness. Because in that place in the offertory, Abuna lays down the sin on the lamb. So there's an exchange. Because we remember the baptism, it is the place where John the Baptist were practicing forgiveness of sins. And how he did it by exchanging between us and Christ as the Lamb of God. The, what we remember is the baptism. And the two major themes in the baptism, two revelations, the revelation of the Trinity and the revelation of... That's why the biggest song in the offertory is, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us pray, let us be glad and rejoice in it. O Lord, what do we say? O Lord, bless us. O Lord, ease our ways. And then the second one, which is equally important, glory be to the Father and the Son, the the long one. The doxology of the church. So these are the two big themes of the church. The, the joy of being forgiven, the joy of being blessed, the joy of being revealed to us, the Trinity, and also the, the Trinity. Next, we go into the, the liturgy of the word. The liturgy of the word has two important messages. But I wanted to retitle this, the liturgy of the word, eyes to see, ears to hear. And that's where I wanted to go with you to the book of Isaiah. Because this is our journey starting there. So let's go to the book of Isaiah and read. In chapter 6. This is the beginning of Isaiah visions. He, he had not seen yet anything. Chapter 6, he says, In the year that King Isaiah that died, I, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the, the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe to me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongues from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged, before he sent on a mission. Now, I always ask myself, he goes into the temple, or he is taken spiritually into the temple, and he goes and sees God of hosts, the Lord of hosts. And he uh, saw the seraphim. He took the time to see the seraphim, and he look, took a time to look at their wings. And, um, and uh, we know from other places, and maybe it's not here, that they have eyes all over. So they all have eyes, the seraphim and the seraphim, they have eyes around. And then there was, in Ezekiel, they have the eyes on the wheels. <clears throat> but then he waits until they cry and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory to be shaken himself. He, he started to be shaken when they uttered the, the, the singing. Holy, holy, holy. And I asked myself, why would he wait until the singing to be shaken? He was not shaken before when he saw the vision. I mean, I imagine when he see God in the throne, he would be falling on his face immediately. But he waited until he looked at the seraphim, and then when he saw, heard the song, he started to be shaken. And I asked myself, why? And I want to ask you why. Why this happened after the seraphim had sung? You would hear this also in the book of Revelation. We go with you to the book of Revelation too, and in Ezekiel too, where he sees the 
Let's so share a beam. What is the next line? What is the next line? Yeah. He says, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. My eyes have seen the cave. Yeah. Uh, that might do it. But it doesn't, it doesn't, he doesn't feel it until they sink. That's what I'm saying. It, if, if that's the case, he would have fell on his face immediately. But he waits until they sink. And then he says, he said to himself, what is the purpose of their song? Exactly. So they had experience. It's almost like you have somebody who's so, so fiery singing or talking. They affect you. They shake you. But what is their advantage? Um, well, that's one thing. And they also they have the best vision and the best voice. The best vision. The best vision. Because their eyes are so open to see God, they actually have the hardest and the strongest voice. That is actually, you can go to the Byzantine when they sing that the Cherubimic hymn. Byzantine church has this song. It says, we who like re mystically represent the Cherubim, let us cast out all earthly care and go to behold, to see the king of all who comes invisibly upon the heavenly host. It means the spiritual person can see things more than the earthly person. That's what, what this is meaning. So Isaiah here goes to the, to the vision in a way unprepared. You can see this in the touching of the lips. And he hears and he sees and then he hears. Then the hearing and the seeing is part of this openness. He's actually un, in discovering God. He's making a discovery. And then that discovery shocked him because he compared himself and said, whoa. That means, by the way, they say that the glory of God is filling the earth that he is with everyone, that he's here. But we're eyes, we need eyes to see, ears to hear. And the problem is, when he discovered that presence, he feels his unworthiness. That's what I'm trying to start with. Because it is Christ who's going to be saying to his disciples, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. We don't feel most. Yeah. And I think that you and then when Christ spoke to the Israelites, had the same effect. It is chapter 13 where he spoke about the parable of the sower and the seed. Listen to this. You know this chapter. This chapter. But uh, listen to the part that after, after the, this parable. The purpose of the parables, that's St. Matthew. In chapter 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has been not, not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. And another gospel says what he thinks he has. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, that is the same chapter of Isaiah that we read. Hearing you will hear and you shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the heart of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so I should heal them. And then he, Christ continued. This is not Isaiah, that Christ speaks. So this is chapter 6. If you go back, that's the, the rest of chapter 6. 
But then he says, but blessed are your eyes for the see and your ears for the hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And he explains to them the parable of the sower and the seed. What is he saying? He said that the gospel that he's preaching is a mystery. It is hidden. Those who have eyes and ears, like the apostles, will understand. Those who doesn't have the eyes and the ears will not. It be, to them would become very dull, very useless. And that's the parable of the soil and seed. That the soil that is very good, the seed was something important. But the, the stone and the, the gravel and the thorny, the seed didn't do anything. It was like useless. So by just extension of this, I would go with you to Revelation. We've done this before. I want to just make sure that we get it. In Revelation, in the New Testament, there is something like that. When the book of Revelation is constructed, part of the making up of the book spiritually is the seeing and the hearing. You can see this many places. Um, when you go to chapter 4, See, that theme in the Bible about seeing and hearing is very prominent everywhere. Chapter 4, five, 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll within, written inside on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or in earth under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and, and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, that's the 24 priests. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. So he said, when, you say, when somebody say something, what you do, you hear. So he heard one of the 12, 24, saying that there's a lion. He will open the scroll. But then it says, and I looked. So when he heard the description of the person who's going to open the scroll, it was a lion. When he looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and, and, the, and the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. He heard that it was a lion, but when he looked, it was a lamb. You're going to see this a lot in the book of Revelation. Everything pertains to heavenly things, comes to us through an open eye and open ear. If I don't have the open eye and open ear, there will be no vision. But they need to complement each other. The seeing alone doesn't do it, and the hearing alone doesn't do it. It has to be the eyes and the ears. Let's go forward a little bit, and then this explains much more things to us than uh, when you take it without this understanding. And then you go into the 24,000th. Are we following? I hope I'm not missing you. Yes, the 144, I'm sorry. 144, that was sealed. Um, then look at this, verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. This is what? Again, focus on this one. It's the hearing. That's the faculty of the ear. And the number of those who have, were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And he heard the numbers of the tribe of Judah, tribe of Reuben, tribe of Gad, and look at the end of it. And after these things, I looked, right? And behold, a great multitude which no one had numbered. Do you understand anything? I hope you do. What do you understand? Yes, this is not literal, but they are the same. That 144,000 are the same as this. He's looking and hearing the same thing about the same subject. And the hearing he heard that they were 144,000. 
But when he looked, there was no count to them. He heard it was a lion. Yes, but here is the point. Is Jesus a lion? No. Is he a lamb? No. He is a human? No. It is all metaphors, right, exactly. There are two angles that you look at spiritual things with it, and each angle of them would give you something extra. When you put them together, it impacts you. It changes your life. One of them alone would not do it. So it's almost like when you open your eyes and ears in the gospel, when, when it is read, when the letter of the, the Bible is read, and you get transformed, and you get moved, and you get changed, and you understand things about God that you, know, you couldn't understand before. The writer from the second century, uh, I think the second century was uh, uh, Oregon. Oregon. He said that. He said only the people who have or again, who has the eyes and the ears, can understand the Gospels. The smell and the taste and the touch. Yes. Yes, one word and one letter at a time. Yes. You just, you're all struck. God is glorious and encourages you. But now we have to hear you. You're supposed to be doing. Right. Exactly. My, my, my exercise is successful. He's in the court. You hear what's down the hall, and then you, you see. see. It, it first, uh, and usually, but not in Isaiah. You hear first, but then you see. Yeah. Like he heard the lamb, and then he, uh, the lion, and he looked at the lamb. He heard the number, and then he looked at saw the multitude. In Isaiah, it's the opposite. He saw first. And then he heard. This is another occasion of hearing first and then seeing. It's, it's Job. By the ears I've heard about you. Now I see. That is exactly. Right. Seeing is believing is true. Catholic and not. Yeah. Absolutely. The faculties of a human being, when it's taken by the Holy Spirit, it does. You know, how do you think the, the visions happened in the prophets? 
It is the Holy Spirit taking hold of the imagination. Exactly. And then that's what, uh, I, there's, there's actually very crazy stuff when you, talk, you read Jung and how he thinks about what we call the active imagination. It is really crazy. Maybe one day we'll talk about it. So let's go to the Simeon that we read tonight. Okay? And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem. So St. Mary and Joseph takes the baby Jesus to Jerusalem, to the temple to present him at 40 years old, at 40 days old. He was 40 old days to be presented. There, behold, was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when he, the, the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, According to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, a light, and the glory to your people Israel. Now, let me just have you stop here and think about it for a little bit. What did Simeon see? Messiah. And what would everybody in the temple saw? A baby, right? A regular baby, like any other baby, a 40-year-old boy. Well, how, how would you explain that? Hmm? He heard before about it. This is what revealed to him, but we don't know how, how, how the revelation was. So you can think of it as a hearing. But why, why would he see the salvation and the light? He said that. Light to the Gentiles. I have seen your salvation, which have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. So he saw in Christ the salvation and the light that was seeing. My eyes have seen. Yeah, the hearing that happened before. Exactly. So he was prepared to a vision, to something. We don't know the details of it. But only him, only him can have that. Exactly. Only him can see that because he has been prepared. Right. Show up. And then when it shows something in him, was completely sure that was it. We don't know what that something is. It's a, yes. This is what Christ is talking to the disciples. Blessed are your eyes for the sea and your ears they hear. People otherwise would see in him a regular man walking around. Well, that's just there at 25, he sees a, he's a just and devout man. Yes. A, Waiting. Waiting. Because he was alive. promised. Alive. Yes, he was fully alive. And he had a promise that he would not die until he would see the Christ. That's what I want to come. This is all introduction. Hopefully that, that's not too long. Okay. So let's go through the liturgy and find out this in the liturgy. So in the liturgy of the word, we have portions from the Bible, and it's five books, five portions that we read. We think of it as the five loaves and the two fish. Church offers to the people, to the church members, the five loaves broken for us to feed on. The Catamaras ones, Pauline, Catholic own, Book of Acts, and the Psalm and the Gospel. From the Cynic Stadium, there is a reading of the, psalm, the saint of the day. And that's the book. And during this, uh, the priests usually pray with incense and offer an incense. And he incense before the sanctuary door. During... I have a question. Yes. Because I seem to think you don't give her his agent to get what she wants. No, I do. But no, no, not that. But and when somebody yeah, makes a mistake... I usually, I usually don't like the jingling. 
at soul food. Yes, it is. But it, 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 it is when you have no jingling. People are quiet and he's going quietly and praying. But what is the priest praying during the Pauline letters? Have you ever wondered about that? What is he asking for? Let's read it and tell me what you think he's asking for. It's a mystery of the Pauline. That's exactly a mystery of the Pauline incense. Uh, o God of knowledge and give her wisdom. That's how he starts the prayer. It's a time to actually think about it who uncovers the deep things from darkness and gives the word to the preachers of the gospel with great power, who out of your goodness, called Paul, who was a persecutor for a long time. So why would God say the, the God of knowledge and the giver of wisdom, the priest would say, it, who uncovers the deep things from darkness? Anybody an idea? This is true. But also because St. Paul and, and St. Peter's mind, it's actually St. Peter who talked about St. Paul saying, they, exactly. Unlearned was twisted to their own destruction. Exactly. So St. Peter was saying that St. Paul writes very difficult things. Our beloved brother, Paul, <laughs> with a lot of love. It was love. And he said he writes very difficult things that people who does not know would twist it to their own destruction. So the priest starts with that. He starts with that these are hard things. St. Paul writes very hard things. Sometimes it's very difficult to understand. So it says, O God of knowledge and giver of wisdom, who uncovers the deep things from the darkness and gives the word to the preachers of the gospel with great power, who out of your goodness called Paul, who was a persecutor for a long time, to be a chosen vessel. With this, you are pleased that he be an apostle, one elect and preacher of the gospel of your kingdom. A chosen vessel. You know when they consecrate the utensils of the church? The bishop would consecrate it during the Pauline epistles. Because Paul was a chosen vessel. So you get the chosen vessels and consecrate them. Thinking of St. Paul. Um, oh, oh Christ our God. Now we also, so who is this, who is this ad addressed to? To Jesus, to the, to the Son, to the second person of the Trinity. Now also we entreat you, O oh God, the lover of mankind. That's the prayer now. Grant us and all your people an unoccupied mind and a pure understanding that we may learn and understand how profitable are your holy teachings, which you have now been read to us from him, from Paul. Even as he became like you, O chief of life, so make us like him in deed and doctrine, that we may glorify your holy name and be ever proud of your cross. And you are he unto whom we send up the glory, reverence, and worship with your good father. So this prayer is offered to, 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 to the son, to Christ, not to the father. But what is it about? Exactly. So this is the beginning of the reading, and this is the beginning of prayer, that the priests actually pray earnestly, that people come with uncluttered eyes and ears, so they can see, they can hear. Exactly. A practice. You know what I want to do in the church? What I want to do is to have the deacons prepare the readings the night before. And there should, be no, there should be no kids reading. It should be adults read very clearly. You make it more difficult by mumbling it as a deacon. So I think it should be adults who read, not yet little kids. And then the, this is a, the work of the church. It should be taken seriously. Can Peter do that? Yes. No, I mean, I mean for the people who are going to read, but we have to assign them before. So we have deacons for the altar. We should assign people for reading. I think so. I think it's very important that we do that. You don't read. No. I agree. I agree. So do you, do you tonsor people as we don't. We don't. That's the problem. I think that's what we need to do. What? Tonsoring. There is. Uh, not but we don't tonsor him. We don't. 
No, we don't. No. No, 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 wait. Tonsoring is to actually educate them and learn. But that's, that's the, the final stage. But the whole process of it is to get them to that stage. The training part. Okay, next. Because it's the universal. You know, when... No, actually... No, mainly because Paul wrote the letters to specific churches. So his letters have to have some background understanding of what he's talking about. Ah, okay. For those communities. Yes, but the Catholic epistles are addressed to... Everybody. That's what St. Peter starts saying to my brethren in the diaspora. Okay. He doesn't really tell... This is for Timothy, and he specifically tell him about the church problems that he has, or the Corinthians. Right, but it is, it is, it is general. There is no specific problems. Maybe there is one. There's a, the, 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 the Trifos. Yes. Right, but it's not. It's not that the, the Pauline epistle is written for specific issues. Yes, specific issues exactly. Priests, uh, uh, prayer during the Catholic epistle. O Lord God, who through your again, what is the reason of prayer? What is the quest? What is the request of God? O Lord God, who through your holy apostles have manifested to us the mystery of the gospel of your Christ, Christ's glory, have given them according to the greatness of the unlimited gift of your grace, that they should preach in all nations the glad tidings of the unsearchable riches. Of your mercy, we ask you, here is the, question, the, the, the request, to make us worthy of a share and the inheritance with them. Grant us at all times to walk in their footsteps, to imitate their struggle, to have communion with them in the sweat which they accepted for the sake of godliness. Guard your holy church which you have founded by them. Bless the sheep of your flock and increase this vine which your right hand has planted through Christ Jesus our Lord. For, the, the, for uh, this is he through whom glory, honor, power, and worship are due to you together with him and the life given. So which person is this addressed to? Huh? Listen to the last part. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, this is he through whom glory, honor, power, worship are due to you together with him, the Father. Yeah, that considered as apostles of the Father through the Son. Um, because he says, through Christ Jesus our Lord, this is he in the third person. This is he. This is not you. This is he. Um, okay, so what is the request? See, that's all oh, we ask you, O oh, our Lord, to make us worthy of the share and the inheritance with them. Grant us at all times to work in their footsteps, to imitate their struggle to have communion with them in the sweat they accepted for the sake of godliness. He's asking to have all of us share in the faith and the lifestyle and the glory of the apostles. The apostles become our partners in the Catholic because they're talking to us. Peter, John, Jude, uh, they talk to us. And James, what is the 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 acts? The acts is um, the last part. O God, who accepted the offering of Abraham instead of Isaac, prepared the lamb. Even so, our Lord, accept from us this offering of incense and send us in return your abundant mercy and lead us to be pure from all sin, and worthy to minister in purity and righteousness before your goodness, O Lover of mankind. So that is a request of. He says, it's an, an offering of incense. Take the incense and give us. I got lost. It's the last part of the first page on, the, on, on page one. O God who accepted the offering, the priest has a last part. Before the acts and the sin. Before the acts and the sin. Sorry. Uh, accept from us also this offering of incense, send us in return. There is an offering and receiving. 
Again, that's the thing. So he's asking God to accept an offering of incense and give us what is it we have we, we, we ask to be given in the book of Acts. And so I so this offering in return your abundant mercy, lead us to be, be pure from all sin, worthy to minister in purity and righteousness before your goodness. The purity and the righteousness. Okay, then the trisagion. That comes from Isaiah and Revelation. The gospel. We come to the mainstay of the... In the gospel, let's go to the... We have a litany. And the litany says... Um, let's read the litany together. That is in page 2 on the left-hand column. And the priest, the second priest, third priest uh, saying... O Master and Lord Jesus Christ our God, who told his holy and honored disciples and pure apostles that many prophets and righteous men earnestly desired to see what you see, they could not, and to hear what you hear, and they could not. Blessed are your eyes, they see, and your ears, they can hear. Make us worthy to hear and perform according to your holy gospels through the petitions of your saints. What is this request for? And it is a very profound one. Hmm? To open the eyes and the ears. Why? Why is that a request? Exact to be doers and to be changed and transformed in the liturgy of the word. But also it acknowledges one important fact. What is this fact? Exactly. It cannot be our own work. Exactly. So that the Holy Spirit will open the eyes and the ears. To make that miracle in us, to become like the blind man who was born blind, to be open, to be able to see Christ. So this is acknowledgement of an inability to uh, to see. What is so uh, profound after that is after the people start singing Alleluia, the priest goes around, go to the right second, the right hand column, column, and the second priest saying, "That's a prayer inaudibly." Lord, he's going around. This is after he finished the litany, who goes around? So you recognize these faces. <laughs> okay, on this, on this slide, you see what's happening? The priest goes with the deacon around the altar, carrying the gospel in their hands, and he's saying inaudibly, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring salvation to Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. The deacon then takes the cross, leaving the gospel of the priest, and stands at the door of the sanctuary, raising the cross and proclaims. What is happening here? He just finished the litany to ask God to open the eyes and the hearts and the, and the ears. He's going around saying the prayer of Simeon. So the priest says, I am sure that you opened my eyes and you opened the eyes of the people to at least get a glimpse of the light that was supposed to be. Why is holding, why is he, what is this? Any idea? I think I understand what this is coming from. In the Greek and the Armenian, there is nothing like this. You don't have it. They don't have it. Hmm? It's uh, in the left hand the gospel, and the right hand is the incense and the cross. They don't have that. What they have is this, the book, gilded in, in gold and silver. But I don't know what happened. We kind of split what well, we go around. It's actually a silver box. Exactly. Yes. And it is completely inside. What what is this supposed to be? Is a big book with a lock that you bring out after the... This is a procession of the gospel. You make an honor to the gospel by proceeding. It's almost like Jesus being around us as a baby or as he goes around Jerusalem and around the, the Judea and, and Galilee to, and people are giving him proclamation of the kingdom. That's supposed to be. That is supposed to be. That is why I believe in the processions we sing. Why? <clears throat> so we sing before the Apolline Epistle. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
heaten nebris veyente tithotokos. Why? <coughs> we sing uh, uh, Taishuri, Taishuri. We sing Tenosht, we sing Ekiz Marot and uh, Sheri Maria. Why? Most probably give time to the priest to finish the procession. So once he's finished, we need the book that he's holding so we can read. Yes? So in the past, when he held the book, the reading would not happen. Never. 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 Yes. And they would sit, and the church would be quiet, and they would read. Yes. And in the Armenian church, I don't know what is your experience. It is the same book that they bring out from the altar. Because, yes, that is why I have the, the always I put the gospel very clear on the altar. Why? The book of Revelation said that. He saw, he saw this scroll, and it, it, we're going to go to the, the anaphora, and we're going to talk about the Revelation book. He had the book closed in the throne. And then when the lamb appeared, the lamb opened the scroll, and he started talking, right? He started reading it and opening the seals. So as the scroll stays in the altar, it is closed. Once the scroll is brought out of the altar, it is opened, and now we read Absolutely. But I believe that is the original because all the churches are doing this. Right. And not only that, not only that, but also it says that the gospel, the word is coming from the altar. It is not separate. The word of God is coming directly from the throne, from where God is. It is not something that we have a split between what is here and what is here? It is coming from the altar. It is coming to us from the hand of God. Right hand of the person who comes, who sits on the throne. He says the scroll was on the right hand of the person who sits on the throne. So it is coming from God to us. This is the word of God. Even if Christ is uttering it, it is the word of the Father. And Jesus said, this is not my words. It is the words of whom, him who sent me. Okay? That is what you have. And you get, go with the gospel around. We go around the altar only. Oh, okay. So if you have an entrance and you're holding this big gospel. Exactly. Like, it's like See, now you've made the church because now Christ is entering. Entering as, as exactly. So I noticed that all the traditional churches, they have the gospel go around the church. Catholics, Greeks, Russians, Armenians, Syrian, they go around the church. We are the only church that does that, that uh, circle around I believe it, just uh, this is all my own suggestions or assumptions, because of the Muslim persecution. You can't have golden folded books going out in the church. They might take it. They would just stand at the door, wait until it comes their way, and they would just take it, and nobody can say anything. So everything stays in the altar. We had shrunk our movements into... Yes. I think that is, and many churches actually are doing this. They have one big book, they keep it at the altar, and then they bring it out to read it. Yeah. But that's why they have the deacon carry it with him. And that's why the <laughs> poor deacon. <laughs> you know what? You know what? The deacon actually stands with it. This is not Abuna who carries it. A deacon stands with the big book up high, and Abuna is offering incense. That's it. He doesn't carry it. Exactly. Exactly. I thought you would make a mark of it, but I didn't think you. That is exactly what it is. No, this is a smaller uh, New Testament. Smaller Testament. It cannot be opened. This cannot be opened. It is completely closed. It has just become symbolic. But event, it, originally, it has a meaning. This is the book that comes from the altar. No, this is uh, maybe a gold. I forgot. It usually have silver. They don't have gold there. It's all silver. But do you get it? That's, that's the whole point of this book. It comes from the altar for God to send us his word. And with it, he would send the eyes and the ears. So he sends the word and sends the deception of it. Okay. Let's move. That's why he is going around the altar. And at the end of it, he would say, blessed is he 
who comes in the name of the Lord. He says it in Coptic. And this is Simeon. And then this is what he is saying. He say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He said in Coptic, uh, the priest would say this twice. Once here, another time, the people would say it. Where? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Twice. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Communion. Do you get it? And this one, Christ coming to us from the Father as a teacher. At the end, as I bring out the bread that's broken and the wine, what is he coming to us as? A sacrifice. And in these two times, I recognize him as a king. In those times, the teacher king and the sacrifice king. Yes. They, they say that in the communion, right? Right. But, but this is the greeting of the king. This is where we realize Christ is in his kingdom, in the church. So this, this is the first time. In the book of St. John, let me just show you something, because it's important to understand this too. In the book of St. John, there is a significant separation between the two. We're done. Uh, St. John, Gospel. Notice here that St. John has a very sharp hinge in the Gospel where things change. Listen to this. This is not without a purpose, by the way. Completely with the purpose what the Church is doing and the Gospel. Um, after the, after they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Let's look at this. This is not a coincidence at all. They say, Hosanna, this is uh, Palm Sunday, right? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, when Jesus he found a young donkey, etc. Then he goes to the same chapter. Um, he speaks about the wheat, the grain of wheat. This is one discourse. He doesn't change it. Then, then he says, he, but although, this is it, verse 37, the same chapter, the same chapter of the same place, the same day, although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For they could not believe, because as I said again, blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should see with their eyes, they should understand with their hearts, they turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because at first he did not confess him, lest they should be put out as synagogues, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out, and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but believes in him who has sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. When he hears my word and does not believe, I do not judge him. I did not come to judge the world, but save, save the world. He who rejects me and not receive my words has that which judges him. The word is all about what he's saying. I have spoken will judge him in the last days, for I have not spoken my own authority, but the Father who had sent me give me a command, the gospel that comes out from the altar. What I should say and what I have to speak, and I know that his command is everlasting. There, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. There's, I think, part that I missed. It's just difficult to scroll down and up in this one. Now, let's go before this crying, this, this last saying. There's something I think we, we skipped over. Um, Yeah, but there's also something more profound. Here it is. That's it. I missed it in the beginning. Before he said all this, talk is almost behind the scenes. Um, he said, then Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while they have the light. That does, this darkness overtake you who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in light so you may become sons of light. Look at this. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Chapter 12, Christ decided he's not going to show himself anymore to the Jews. He's done talking. 
There will be more, no more talking. What happened in chapter 13, that the part that we just read, I just skipped that part that I wanted to show you, that he's hidden from them, he's not showing himself anymore. What happens in chapter 13? Now before the Feast of Prophet, when Jesus knew that he had, his hour had come, he should depart from this world to the Father, he started to wash the, the feet of his disciples, do the Last Supper, goes to Gethsemane, captured, goes to the cross. So on Sunday, or somewhere in that, in that week, he made a decision. He's not going to show himself to the Jews, nor speak to them. And he hides. And that's why in the liturgy we make a point to take the gospel that we were reading, that silver gospel is supposed to be, and we hide it behind the throne. There's a point. The deacon should be aware of it. That liturgically, the gospel should be hidden. Nobody can see it anymore. But the rest of the week, and or, or I make a point that the gospel is very clear. Everybody see it on the ha right hand of the throne. It should be standing very clear to everybody to see it. And whenever I take it, I take it and bring it back to that place. Except in the liturgy. Once we move from the gospel, and I, ha I put it on the right side, it hides. There is no one to see it. What is the point? He's done being the preacher. He's done being the talker. He's now preparing himself to be the lamb, the sacrifice. And the throne is not for the, I'm not talking about bishop. The throne is where the cup is. We call it the cup. We call it the throne because in the, in the Old Testament, they call it the mercy seat. And we call it the mercy seat. Okay, so what happens at the end of the gospel? There's certain things we say, what is the word? Amen. So be it. And then a uh, very beautiful person said something, uh, you know, Lev Gile, the orthodox writer. He said something very beautiful. He said, an orthodox, uh, he said, in saying amen, our whole life and being are engaged in an act of faith and ardent trust. To say this word is to make a commitment to Christ totally. When you say amen, you're giving your life totally to him. Uh, the word alleluia, it's two words. By the way, just between you and me, you're not going to find in the Old Testament no alleluia in the New King James. There is no alleluia in the Old Testament. Why? Anybody knows? New King James, I'm talking, or King James. Translated in the Hebrew, praise the Lord. But then you go to the Hebrew and ask what is the meaning of Alleluia. Allel, allel means to be out of yourself, to be excited, to give praise. In another way, to act foolishly. Ya is an abbreviation of God. So the, the translation that should be to go crazy for God, to be out of yourself, to completely go ecstatic. Exactly. That's the Pentecostal word. And that's the part of the church that's Pentecostal. And then uh, what is the word? Doxa si kyrie. It's actually kurie. Doxa is glory be to the Lord. Or Lord, glory be to you means honor, glory, uh, whatever praise. These are traditional words uh, that we need to know in the book, in the, the uh, liturgy of the word. Um, okay, that, that is it. In the New Testament, only four in the Revelation. You would find it in the New Testament. But the Old Testament in the New King James, in the Hebrew, translated, praise the Lord. I don't think so. In the, in the translation. You pick, up, you pick up the whole Bible and you read the Psalms. You would not find it. Exactly. Praise, praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord is Alleluia. It doesn't say Alleluia, exactly. They translate it. Because Alleluia is the Hebrew. Alleluia is the Hebrew. We, we say both. Praise Him. That's supposed to be Alleluia. Yes. It is. Yes. But we translate it. In the Hebrew, it has more than praise. Just it's more powerful. Like in the Greek. Yes. In the Greek, it's more powerful to say things in the Greek because Pantocrator cannot be translated. That's the thing. <laughs> hallelujah. Absolutely. And we say hallelujah a lot of times. Hallelujah is a great uh, hymn in the church. We have like how many songs, how many tunes for hallelujah? 
تهليل to praise and to be ecstatic to be out of تهليل بالضبط out of oneself joyfully okay any questions We only do it in peace. Okay, so I was told the reason why they even bothered with the, with the second one was so that they could wait for the emperor and all the other babies. Most probably. Come in. Most probably. So they had to just keep things running until they showed up. And that's why they had the flags and the things. It was very, very royal. Yeah. The flags and how they made it. It's almost like royal flags. Not liturgically, but just for the church. The Byzantine was very extravagant. Okay, let's say our Father. Do you have any comments? I get anything. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, I mean, make us worthy, O Lord, to say, thank we, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, thine is the kingdom, power, and glory now, and forever. May the love of God the Father and grace of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Live in peace, peace be with you.